Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer, and I work in marketing and communications for Renew International. Welcome to our webinar on Does Baptism Really Matter? And my apologies for things running a little late. We had another meeting run right into this, and so things got a little backed up. But we're so happy to have you with us today. And we, as we get going, I will let you know that uh, this is being recorded so that you can view this later if you'd like to. And also, I will be monitoring the chat box and the question box. So please, if questions occur to you as we go along, do put something in and I will relay them on to our presenter, Mary Foy. And on that note, I will hand things over to Mary. Okay, and here I am. Hi, everybody. So glad you could join us today for our webinar, the fourth one in the series of topics of baptism. This one called, Does Baptism Really Matter? We're going to talk a little bit about uh, baptism as a part of the community, as part of what we do at Mass as fellow Catholic Christians, and some practical ideas for how you might be able to bridge the gap that is present in some parishes between the Saturday baptisms and the Sunday liturgies. So I do hope that uh, everybody's excited about being here like I am. At Renew, I'm the Associate Director of Pastoral Services, and I'm also a pastoral associate at a parish. So a lot of these things I've had happen in my own parish and seen happen in other parishes where I work. So yeah, hopefully it'll be good, some good concrete information for you. As Jen had pointed out, uh, we have a chat box in the bottom where you can put your questions in and she'll be keeping an eye on those. And at the end, we'll have time for questions and comments. I'm going to bring this up and bring this over. OK. Let me just shrink this down a little bit. Okay. All right. So does baptism really matter is the name of our webinar for today. Uh, it comes from the name of our seer, our program, our new program, Baptism Matters, which talks, it's a three-part program that has online training modules for staff, for parents, and for godparents. And it, a lot of people are finding that online now, especially since so many people can't get out and around, that it's being a really helpful thing. But today we're going to talk about, does baptism really matter? Okay, now as Jen said, this webinar will be recorded. You'll get a link in the mail. If you have questions, you want to put it, put them in the chat box, and we'll talk to them about them at the end of the webinar. A little bit about Renew International, if you're not familiar with us. Uh, our specialty is small groups, small Christian communities, where we try to uh, renew personal faith and parish life, to unlock the power of the small group by equipping both laity and clergy to share their Catholic faith and to live it out each and every day. We'll start today with our opening prayer, if you were on any of the other baptism seminars, this is the same prayer that we use throughout, the same prayer that we have in our sessions. This would be the prayer that the staff would pray before each of their learning sessions. And we'll pray it now together. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus Christ, our brother, our teacher, our Savior. By your life, death, and resurrection, you have gained for us the gift of baptism. In this sacrament, each child will receive, as we have received, a new birth into life filled with the Holy Spirit. In this sacrament, each child will be called, as we have been called, to practice the Christian faith by loving God and our neighbor. May our example inspire all children to live as your disciples by reaching out in charity and justice, especially to those most in need. We make this prayer to you, to the Father, to the Holy Spirit, who live and reign as one God, 
forever and ever. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. I thought before we talk about how baptism is a part of the parish now, we talk about how baptism started. And if, if you know the picture of our friend there in the stained glass window, uh, I would offer you an a reward. But since we're virtual, you'll just have to get a pat on the back. If you remember, that's St. Irenaeus. He lived about 100, between 100 and between 100 and 200 AD. So he was there pretty much at the beginning when baptism became something that instead of being done one or two people at a time, when a ceremony or a ritual began to attach itself to the pouring of the water and the anointing. And he, he was the first, one of the first writers that we could find who actually speaks about infant baptism. He says, Jesus came to save all through himself. He says, infants, children, youths, and old men, every age. He became an infant for infants to sanctify infants. Sometimes at our baptism prep classes and when we talk about baptism in a parish, we'll, somebody will ask, why does the Catholic Church baptize children? If you know, Children can't make their own decision. They can't make their own mind up. And this is one of the quotes that I like to use in that situation that Jesus came on earth as a infant and thus made infants holy. The same way him coming here on earth as a man or a, a human made all humans holy. Gave us a, a sanctification that we otherwise wouldn't have. Jesus didn't have to come as a child. He could have come as a totally grown up person. He could have come as a as an old person. He could have come as a teenager. I don't know if any, I don't know, teenagers are kind of tough to handle. I don't know if I'd be able to do that. But Jesus could have come as a, he could have picked anything, but he picked an infant and therefore showed us that infants are just as holy, just as sanctified as adults. Here's a picture I found. This is on a, a like catacomb in Italy, and it talks about early baptisms. Now, this guy's not quite an infant, but early baptisms were pretty much done by immersion. I don't know who that guy, that might be Arrhenius baptizing him. I really can't tell, but it was a situation where people, they go to a creek or a stream or a river, and they would immerse themselves in the water, and they would also have water poured over their heads, much like this gentleman's doing here for this guy. And you can see he's not by himself. There's quite a few other people around and probably some people who didn't make get into the final cut. Baptism was a community event. It's not just between this guy with his head down and God or this guy with his head down and the bishop or who's ever baptizing him. It's between the entire community and him and God. It's the not only the gentleman here in, in this case being baptized into the family of God, but he's being baptized into the family of the church where he finds himself right now. He's baptized in this community, these other folks here. I guess the beginnings of his parish, the beginning of his, his church family. And that's also what baptism does. It also brings the baby or the child or the adult into the family of the church. We're going to go a little bit further ahead, somewhere around 1940. For some of you, it would be your grandparents. For some of you, it would be your great grandparents. For some of you, it'll be your parents. For some of you, it might be you. <laughs> Pre Vatican II and earlier, 30s, 40s, 50s, pretty much up until the 1960s, all baptisms were private. And oddly enough, mom and dad weren't there. The godparents would go to the house, pick up the baby, and take the baby to church to be baptized. Occasionally, the father may have come. But if for mom to have been at a baptism was extremely rare. 
there's a couple of reasons for that. You know, it's it was done very shortly after birth. Two weeks was not uncommon. And a lot of moms didn't feel up to getting dressed and going to church at that point in time. It was also done to solidify, I guess, to cement the role of the godparents in the child's life. The godparents were the children's parents in the church. It was their responsibility to raise, to raise them in the faith, to make sure that the parents fulfilled their responsibility to have a Catholic home, to take them to church, to take them to religious classes, whatever they had to do. Only the godparents were at the godparents and the priest were at the baptism and the baby, of course. They they let the baby come too. The godmother would even buy the outfit and bring the clothes to the house or to or dress the baby in the church so the mother wouldn't even see the outfit. The mother never picked it out, never saw it. There were no classes, no preparation for anybody, except maybe the priest. But godparents, parents, there was no teaching about it. There was no teaching during the ceremony. There was nothing. It was done all in Latin. Even the baby's name. And if the baby had a name that didn't translate or wasn't a saint's name, that they would rename the baby. Oftentimes you'll hear stories, you know, we have a, a, there's a woman I visit in my parish in her 90s and her name is Elizabeth and her name was actually Faith Elizabeth, but Faith wasn't a saint's name. So when she was baptized, she was baptized Elizabeth. I have another older parishioner, her name was Kim, but there's no Saint Kimberly. So she was baptized Mary, even though Mary isn't on her birth certificate anywhere. There was no community or no parish involvement at all. If somebody asked a parishioner, hey, do you have many baptisms at your church? They would have no clue. Baptisms are usually done Sunday afternoon or even Saturday after mass had ended and all the people had gone home. It was a very private affair. Baptism today. Baptisms now are attended by parents, godparents, family, and friends. They can be at Mass. They can be outside of Mass. Although the directions of the uh, canon law and the direction of the catechism says it's better if they are at a Mass where the community is present. And best of all, at a Sunday Mass, because Sunday is the day that we celebrate the Lord's death and resurrection. And that's what baptism basically is. It's a symbolic death and resurrection of the child into God's community, into God's family and the community of the church. The babies now seem to be older, sometimes six months or more. Not only now is the sacrament celebrated in English, but it's also celebrated in Spanish, Tagalog, French, Polish, Lithuanian, Creole, Russian, every language you could think of. The language that the parents and the families speak. And the child gets to be baptized with the name given them by the parents. Much to the chagrin of many presiders who end up baptizing a, a you know, buttercup meadow or, or, you know, tree leaf or things like that. But parents are still encouraged to have a saint's name in there somewhere, but it's not, uh, they don't change the child's name when they do the baptism. This is the way it's done now, but in some families, we still have that old thing. My, well, my son isn't too young now, but he's almost 30. But when he was little, when he was born, it was outrageous. Why, how could you take him to the grocery store if he's not baptized, right? Babies had to be baptized when they were really young. Because what would happen to them if they weren't? If something terrible happened and they died, they would go to a place called, again, if I had, if you were here, I'd be giving you a Tootsie Roll if you knew this one, Limbo. Remember Limbo? Some of us remember Limbo. Limbo was a place where unbaptized babies went. It wasn't heaven, but it wasn't hell. It was like, a, I don't know, hanging out at the mall or something. 
where they would hang out because they hadn't been baptized before they died. So it was the primary importance, first thing out of the hospital, to get that baby baptized and do it now, right? Now, I know we don't have a poll on here, but maybe just real quick in chat, if we could ask people at your parish, do you have baptisms outside mass, inside mass, or both? Can we do that, Jen? Can we ask that? Actually, give me just a moment and I will create that poll. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if I can do this in the middle of the webinar. I'm sorry, I just thought of it this moment. <laughs> That's okay. Inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Right? Remember they used to tell us when we were young, when you're out at a dance, leave space for the Holy Spirit? Here we're leaving space for the Holy Spirit in our poll. <laughs> just so we can get an idea of how many parishes. Some parishes do both. My parish where I minister does both inside mass and outside mass. Of course, now with the pandemic, that's only going to be outside mass. But routinely, how many did you did did you do them inside? Did you do them outside? My parish does 175 baptisms last year. We had to go back for extra oil from the bishop because we used ours up. Yeah, it's a lot of babies in my area. So we need to have them inside mass, outside mass, Saturday, Sunday. We had a couple of Friday night. You just fit them in where you can. Okay, so now let me see if it will let me. It doesn't seem to be okay. letting me, but I have, I have people okay. saying both. Okay. If they could just shot in the chat i guess yep yeah that'll work just the chat will work sorry about my inspiration <laughs> <laughs> but it was you know, it's because it, the needs are different if they're in or out of the mass sometimes they run a little bit different i know some parishes only do them in only do them out some parishes do them both it's hard to uh you can't you know categorize one or the other Okay, so while we're thinking about that, does baptism matter, especially if it's not your kid being baptized? When we do baptisms at Mass, it's funny. We have some Masses where, you know, they see the babies coming in. Oh, no, it's going to be a long Mass. There's a baptism. The actual baptism, by the way, adds about seven minutes to the liturgy, so it's not the end of the world. Oh, I was just able to make it pop up. <laughs> I popped. There we go. Oh, and people are filling it out. <laughs> it's collecting responses. Yay. Thank people you, guys. Can... Yeah, this is this is good because it, it gives us a, a picture of, of how things go in your in your parish. We got almost everybody. We'll give it just a few more seconds. Okay, no more responses coming in, so I'm going to close it out and let's see what we got. Okay, thanks. And share. So there are results. Okay, I am not seeing them, but where would I see them? Um, well, we're, sh we're showing during mass is 13%, outside okay. mass is 33%, and wow. both is 53%. Wow. Okay, cool. Thank you, everybody, for answering your, our poll today. So most folks are doing it inside and outside of mass. So we'll talk about both possibilities as we talk about how to make baptism more important in your parish than it might be right now or maybe what you might hope it would be later so uh, can baptism matter if it's not your kid uh it it's a hard sell sometimes at mass but we're going to talk about some ways you can make it matter because it does matter if even if it's not your kid how can we 
show to the congregation that sometimes baptism matters, even if it's not their kid. And it's a, a four prong approach that I've used personally that has worked. The first thing that helps is catechesis. The more people understand about baptism, and the more they know that it's not just the old days, you and Jesus and the priest and your godparents, that it's different now, that it's new. They might have not ever seen a baptism. There's people in our parishes who've never seen a baptism. If they don't have children, they don't have nieces and nephews in the area, they might have never been to a baptism other than their own. And what they know of baptism will be whatever it was they taught them before they made First Communion. So it may be time for a little extra education. There are some excellent videos on YouTube, particularly from Busted Halo and Outside the Box. Those are two, they're uh, each run by religious orders. Those are two series that have many, many videos. I know Busted Halo has probably more than 50 on all different topics. And one of these topics is uh, baptism. And that's a video that, you know, I've shown. There's also the USCCB bulletin inserts. If you go to the, their website, which has much improved to what it was years ago, because years ago it was outdated. It was hard to, uh, to take information out of it and give it to your, your parishes. It was not easy to read. It was very academic, but now they've really come a long way. And if you don't know, USCCB is the United States Council of Catholic Bishops. And that's a group of all the bishops in the country. And on this website, they have an adult faith formation section that talks about each of the sacraments. And it's a handy dandy one page bulletin insert. So if your bulletin editor, which may be you, is always looking for something to put in those bulletins, something that isn't just ads and about who's having a bake sale and, and you know how much money do you owe me for the raffle tickets. This would be something you could put in. They also have selected articles in Spanish as well. Those are the only two languages they have right now are English and Spanish on the USCCB website. It could also be, you could talk to your pastor and your uh, if you have other priests as well or deacons about mentioning baptism in the homily when it's appropriate. Always that first Sunday in January, the baptism of the Lord, that that's a baptism one. Uh, you could also talk about it around Pentecost. You could talk about it around Easter, especially if you have some RCIA adults or older children who are being baptized. You can talk about it many, many, at many points in the church year. And it's something that is always happening. Like there's no certain time of the year. A lot of some dioceses don't do baptisms during Lent, but other than like Lent and Holy Week, there's always baptisms going. It's a possibility of baptisms going on. They're not seasonal. Like, oh, we can always do them in March. Or we can only do them in July there all around the year. So mentioning them in a homily, if, if there are any of the readings talk about rebirth or talk about water or talk about the spirit or fire, that could all go in there. The more people know about baptism as a sacrament and as a gift, a wonderful gift we get. You remember your hundred questions from confirmation? What is a sacrament? An outward sign of God's grace, yep. A sacrament is a wonderful gift. So the sacrament is a gift to help us get grace and to grow in our faith. You could involve the parish in the baptisms more. I know now with the pandemic, a lot of dioceses are saying that you can't do baptisms at mass because the numbers have to be less. The capacity of your church is smaller. You have to keep six feet apart, whatever it may happen to be in your particular diocese. Here on the East Coast, we're just opening up this weekend, July, uh, June 14th, for our first public mass. And we could only have one third of the church present, of the capacity of the building present for that mass. 
it'll increase as the weeks go on. But, you know, it's starting small. Other places in the country may be different. But they've also, the, our bishop has also said to not do the baptisms during the mass until the social distancing isn't a problem anymore. So our baptisms now will all be outside mass, at least for a while. And uh, th there's a special permission, usually when during the baptism, the priest or deacon will anoint the baby with oil on, on their forehead in order so that the, the celebrant doesn't have to touch the baby with their hand because you can't do a sacrament with gloves on, it doesn't work. They're allowed now to use cotton balls or Q-tips, you know. So it's a the sacrament looks a little different now than it did before the pandemic, but it'll find its way back home. So especially since you can't have them at the masses now, one way to involve the rest of the community would be to take the take a picture of the baby and put the baby's first name in the picture, maybe on your parish Facebook page or website, or put a poster in your your if you have a vestibule or a gathering space with the signed permission of the parent. If you go on your diocesan website, there's usually a place with, by the religious education section that says forms and you'll find that permission slip. Your uh, director of religious education in your parish usually has a bunch too. You don't need the baby's last name. You don't need any identifying, you know, you could just have the baby's name and first name and picture. There's a hospital, a Catholic hospital in our diocese, and they put the newborn babies up on billboards on the side of the road if their parents give permission. And it's so cute. You're driving along the highway and there's this cute little doll baby looking at you from when they were just born with their little hats on. So to, to have the pictures and the baby's first name at least out there and say, you know, pray for our new family members. And then here's the babies in the pictures. Most parents, Lo would love to see their baby's picture on Facebook or see their baby's picture. Again, no identifying things other than their first name or even their first initial, if you want to do it that way, a boy or girl, and be able to share that with their families and print it out. What a memory for that baby when they grow up. Look, here's my picture when I was baptized. Uh, if you don't you usually have baptisms at mass, try to have at least one baptism at mass if possible every month maybe every quarter maybe every year you know i know one parish that does infant baptisms at mass when they do when it's the baptism of the lord sunday in january they don't have many other rest of the year they do them outside but that day they do them at the mass so that the whole community can see what happens during the baptism and the the celebrant kind of explains as he's going along what's happening during the baptism. Like now, now we're lighting the candle and the candle means this and this, you know, so that people are kind of brought along with it because there's nothing like, nothing to cement out what happens except by uh, seeing one. You know, experiencing it is the best way to see it. Even if you're, some celebrants don't like to do it at mass, but even if, if it's not their favorite thing to do, see if you could, Talk to them about maybe doing one a month or one a quarter. Uh, we have one that we bring the communion, our communion candidates to, our first communion kids, and they get to watch a baptism. And, you know, seven and eight-year-olds love babies. So just to see the baby is enough. We Of course, we warn the parents, you're going to have, you know, 20 second graders watching your baby. But they get to actually see one. So they read about it in their book and then they actually see one, not just a video, but a real one. There's plenty of videos too on YouTube if you want to look just YouTube Catholic infant baptism, and you'll see more videos up there than you'll know what to what to do with. If you're a catechist and you want to show, you know, the, the children or show the parents if you do family catechesis, what happens at a baptism? Let them see our baptism program, Baptism Matters, includes we don't have a baptism there live, but we have a, a deacon who's performed baptisms for 30 years, and he and he talks about the different parts of the serve of the ceremony and what they use in the ritual and what the meaning is behind it. So we do that as part of baptism prep in our program and in other places around. The parishioners can also make or give a gift to the babies. 
in our, you know, they uh, during the ritual they'll say you are now clothed in the white garment to show your rebirth. And pretty much babies come with something on that's white, you know, a little white suit or a little white dress. Uh, in our Hispanic community, we have little boys who come in the uh, tails, little bow ties and tails, like little tuxedos. Oh my goodness, you could just lose your mind. So cute. But some babies come in something else. And either way, the parishioners, members of our parish who sew or knit or crochet make bibs for the babies. And they put a little cross on the front and it's a memory from their baptism. So every baby baptized in our parish gets a handmade bib made by another member of the parish to welcome them. And that's not hard to get that started or blankets or hats or even just the candles, you know, the candle that the godparent holds. You could have the parish buy that, the par a group in the parish. You could say, okay, this month our candles are provided by the altar rosary society or provided by the confirmation class. Just something so that the parents know that the, the parish is being part of the celebration. And if you have a parish like ours, you usually have a couple of homebound folks who just knit until, I don't know, I guess until they stop making yarn and they knit copious amounts of blankets and they never have anything to do with them. So here's something they can do, you know, give them a lot of white yarn and let them have at it. We've had people donate fabric and then other people sew the bibs. There's a, you know, a bunch of little things you could do. One parish I heard about takes a picture of the family and puts it in a cute frame and gives it to, and mails it to the parents. You know, something like that, just some, some little reminder to make, to connect the parish and the, the babies and their families. Because as we talked about last time, dealing with young adults, getting them to come to the church, which is hard, it's usually what they're looking for is community. And sometimes that blanket or that card that's signed, you know, congratulations on your baptism, you know, best wishes, third grade, something like that. The religious formation classes can make little cards for the babies. A lot of things you can do. You can have a celebration in your parish for all the babies baptized. That you could have it a month, a year, every week, whatever. Ice cream party, barbecue, cake. A lot of parishes do babies first Christmas. The Sunday that's between Christmas and New Year's. They have a special mass where they invite back all the babies, the families who had a baptism that year, and they have a little cake for them downstairs after. What a beautiful thing. The entire parish joins in the celebration. Invite the baptism families to parish events. Personally works best. If you go to them and you say, you know, or call them up. In our program, we talk about mentor couples who actually work with these couples from the day they come to the office until after the day of the baptism and help them become part of the parish. You know, if, if you had, maybe you taught the baptism class, maybe call those, that parent up, you know, summertime and again, when things open up again and, and say, Wow, you know, we haven't seen little Timmy since his baptism. I'm sure he's really getting big now. We'd love to see him at the picnic in two weeks. Do you think you'll be able to make it? Or even just to call them and say, wow, you know, could you email me a picture? I'd love to see how big she got. She probably outgrew that little dress she wore. Things like that. If you have children, think about what it meant to you when strangers said, or people you weren't, weren't your family said something good about your baby. You felt special. So we want to make them feel special that their baby is not only in their family, but in the family of God. So we want to help everybody know that baptism truly does matter. And these folks are applauding. It's been a wonderful baptism. Here, here. It doesn't only matter for the child, for the family, for the parish, for the church, and for the world. Baptism truly does matter.
questions, comments, concerns? Ideas. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. By the way, your after we came back from the poll, your your face vanished. Oh. I didn't get to see your beautiful face anymore. Oh, I must have hit it when I was hitting the poll thing. Trying yeah, to get I'll, I'll, it, it probably knocked you knocked you out then, and I didn't want to interrupt you because you were on a roll. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, I should be back now. There we go. There we go. Sorry about that. I was hitting those little buttons trying to see the poll. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we had some people who early on were asking about the the, the webinar itself, so I answered those questions. But um, okay. and I know someone was was asking about the Baptism Matters program. Wonderful. Our program on Baptism Matters it's an online based program. And we have there's no printed materials. Everything you get is either you know accessible through a special website we have or it's downloadable for you to print and use, you know, manuals, forms, certificates, those kinds of things. Uh, we have six video modules. The modules are about 20 minutes each. They have video, they have uh, witness statements, families who talk about what baptism meant to them. We have special ones for the staff, which talk about how to make your parish more welcoming how to have your parish view baptism as a mission, part of their work, not just something extra we do on Saturday. We have videos on the meaning of baptism, the meaning of all the signs and symbols for your staff and volunteers to view so that they are up to speed when they work with the parents and they can help them figure out, that they can help answer the parents' questions. We all, It's a very inclusive program. We have all kinds of babies, pictures of all kinds of cute darling babies. And we talk about all types of family situations, which more and more many of us are finding out in the field. You know, it's not, you know, mom and dad bringing, you know, their baby for baptism. There's adopted children. There's uh, parents of mixed faiths, parents of strongly different family uh, traditions got grandparents who are raising their child, their got grandchild because the parents are unable to do that work. There's single moms, there's single dads and everything in between. So we deal a little bit with how to, to sensitively approach these families. And we also have a module of four different lessons, four different classes that are for the parents. And they talk about what baptism means, what are the signs and the symbols? How does the ceremony go? And also about some ideas on raising your child Catholic, which, you know, if you've ever had a baby, you get those uh, things from the diaper company, like now that your baby's six months old, you know, you can do this and this and play this game with them. It's similar to that, how to make, even if you don't, haven't prayed at home before. I mean, not every family sits down and does the rosary after Wheel of Fortune at night. And some do, and that's a beautiful thing. but. To a lot of our young people coming, they have not had that experience growing up. And they want to make faith meaningful for their child, but they really don't know how. You know, well, do I have to do a rosary? No, you could do many other things. And we have a, a gentleman give witness during that video who bought his son a little Jesus doll. If you've seen him, uh, they're ones from Loyola Press. And every time they go to church, he brings Jesus with him. Oh, so he's two. But he already knows that when you go to church, who do you see? Jesus. What a great thing. And it takes no, like, not a lot of effort. The parents don't have to be, you know, saints. They're not like, you know, St. Therese's parents that did all the right things. Simple ways to do it. We also have three sessions for the godparents. Because some parishes require godparents to also attend. And some parishes, it's optional, but... You know, it's always a good idea. Talk to them about their role in the child's life and how they could stay connected even if they're far apart. And we also have an in-person session that goes with after they finish the online work where you could, instead of spending your time explaining to the parents, all right, this is the candle, this is what it means, this is the oil, we do that part for you. So you can spend that hour and a half or two hours or whatever with that family really getting to know them really ministering to them, witnessing with them, 
hearing what's stopping them from being, if they're not fully invested in their child's baptism, what's holding them back? What's making them hesitate? So those, those uh, we deal with that in the program as well. And the next slide, I think, I think it's the next one. Let me say it's the next one, the one with all the. Oh, oh, you vanished again. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to get my next slide, and it's just not not cooperating. Oh, there's me. There I go again. I just keep coming and going, don't I? <laughs> okay, it's this next one here. Uh, for more information on our Baptism Matters program, and if you'd like to see a sample, just email Baptism Matters at renewintl.org. We have a special going on that you can get a free peek from now till the end of the month at the staff modules. The parents' modules still are separate, but you can get a free peek. Just shoot an email. We need your name, your parish name, address, phone number, email, those kinds of things. And uh, one of our sales people, Pete Fiore, is our head of sales. He, he may get back to you or one of our other sales guys, would our sales people would love to uh, talk more about it and to also show you some samples. Okay, we do have some other questions. And someone was asking, can you re repeat the comment about how to anoint with oil now in this new era? Our bishop has said that the celebrants can use either a cotton ball or a Q-tip. I say that your mileage may vary because your bishop may say something else. But our bishop has said, because people here, well, the Northeast, we were hit really, really hard. Here in New Jersey, where I am, we had over, uh, what was it, how many thousands of people died? 12,000. 12,000 people died just in New Jersey, and it's not a big state. So we're still really super cautious here, and I know other places in the country have different rules. So you could probably find out from your office of worship at your diocese if you haven't gotten any directives yet. Or you could find out from um, uh, your pastor may be able to find out from their, the head of their deanery. Okay. But a Q-tip or a cotton ball. And after that's used for the oil, little little oil trivia. After you use that cotton ball or the Q-tip, it should be burned or buried because the oil is the sacramental. Yep. Okay. Someone. Um was asking when you reference older children, is she um, up to six or so? Uh, they say the age of reason, which again in our diocese is seven. But again, your your mileage may vary. After the age of seven, then the children are considered adults. I don't know why, but they would go through a process similar to the RCIA process for adults. So they would receive all three sacraments. This is the way it's laid out in canon law. Again, your diocese may do something different. But, you know, when we talk about infant baptism, we usually mean kids up to about seven. Okay. And someone was asking about seeing uh, examples of what's available, but you uh, gave the, the link onto our website and that will take you right on, right on the main page. Uh, you'll see uh, baptism matters and if you click through on that and it does give you actually right there on the page there is a video that you know you see parts of uh one of the one of the modules so that's there as well so any other questions seems to have gone gone quiet yeah any comments does anybody do anything fun with baptisms at their parish do you give anything out do you have a party what do you do anything It'll take a second. I know that um, one of the parishes near me that I will sometimes go to during the summer, they do baptisms during mass. And one of one of the things that I've always enjoyed about that is that the, the priest will say, you know, let's welcome this new baby. And the priest will walk through the parish, walk through the entire church, holding the baby up and everybody is cheering and applauding. And it's beautiful. It really is. Yeah. It really makes the family feel a part of the parish. It really does. It really does. Well, that's a cute cousin. And that costs nothing, right? And takes right. no time. It takes minimal time. Yeah. The the musicians play something while he's going through something joyful and and yeah. everybody cheers. It's it's really lovely. 
Yeah, especially the older people. So they love to see babies if they they don't have grandchildren nearby or they don't you know have grandchildren at all. Just to see it it renews your faith in the church. It does. Yet as long as there's babies being baptized, we're going to keep going, no matter how glum things may look. <laughs> we still got those babies. And they are beautiful. Well, yeah, nothing they're... else is popping up. So I think we may be all set with that. Okay, we went to uh, talk of uh, uh, the upcoming, wait, sorry, my bad. Uh, we also have some other events and webinars coming up. If you go again to our Renew webpage, renewintl.org, it talks about some other events. A particularly interesting one, if you work with children or parents, Frazzled but Faithful. Ah, Parenting During the Pandemic and its Aftermath. This is a webinar that's going to happen on June 17th at 2 p.m. And you can register for it at that Renew website. It's going to be let it's going to be the leaders of that webinar are going to be Dr. Gregory Popcheck and his wife. You may know them from their work on EWTN or their books. They've also been on Rat on uh, Relevant Radio, and they've been on uh, the one on Sirius XM, Catholic X XM, I think it is. They've been on that radio station as well, and they've written many, many books about parenting. They're both, uh, he's a licensed psychologist, so, and they have, they're both mom and dad, so they've, they've lived it and learned it, so, and they're going to talk about ways that it's been taught, having the kids home and, you know, learning from home and some of the parents working from home or losing their jobs. There's been an incredible amount of stress going on for families during this Everybody says, oh, it's just a fun summer vacation. Oh, I wish, right? This is not a fun summer vacation, and it may not change for a while. So the pop checks are going to talk about some really wonderful ideas about cutting down on the stress in your house and, and ways to, to make it a little bit easier, you know, to be uh, frazzled but faithful, to hang on to your faith life, even if you can't, maybe can't go to church in person or you know, maybe have to watch it on TV or things like that. We also yeah, have if some... If you go to the Renew website, um, you'll see that there's something that says um, events and webinars. And if you click on that, everything's listed there. That's where you'll find it. We also have some other faith sharing webinars going on that you'll find out on that page that meet once a week and people read a passage from a book or a scripture together and then discuss it. And uh, next week on the 16th, we have a webinar, uh, Arise to Evangelize. Arise is another Renew program that's for adult formation and also has an aspect for children. It's useful if you do family catechist, catechism. You might want to take a look at, go to that e informational webinar, find out a little bit more about that Arise program. And that too can be online or in person. So a bunch of exciting stuff happening as we move back to whatever they're calling the new normal this week. It's, uh, you know, I don't know when we'll ever see normal, normal, but, you know, life's an adventure. So did we had no more questions? Uh, also, Renew uh, International, who puts out this webinar and all those wonderful resources that are online and the talk by the pop checks. We're a nonprofit organization. And uh, we continue to offer these free resources like this webinar and the others to help people and parishes renew and live their faith. And we ask you if you're in a position where you can give us a little gift, you know, help us out a little bit to bring these resources without charge when we can and, you know, minimal charge for the parishes and churches around the world. Renew is in 24 countries, something like that. So it is truly a worldwide effort. So again, on the website, there's a donate button and you can just click there and we'd be very appreciative of, of any help that you can give us. And if you can't, please know that you always have our prayers and that we are always thinking about everyone in the church and that they may renew their faith and begin to live closer to their, their gift, their baptism gift of being a priest, a prophet and a king. Well, thank you, Mary. We did, by the way, have, have one person that popped up as you were talking that, to, that their first communion classes make greeting cards for the baptism families. Oh, yeah, well, that's cute, too. That's oh, lovely. I love that idea. And then they could they could get to, to you know, that what a, what a keepsake for that baby's family, right? Absolutely. Oh, 
That's true. Really, it might be neat one day to have like in a couple of years, maybe like a, a ice cream party or something and have the communion kids come back and have the baptism kids come. Yeah. Get to meet the kids that they sent that made the cards for. Yeah. They can meet each other later. That'd be fun. I love an ice cream party, so it's never a bad idea for me. <laughs> ice cream is always a good thing. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Mary. Thank you, everyone, for thank spending you, time with us this afternoon. And yes, you will uh, receive an email with a recording of this webinar in the next couple days. So we hope you enjoyed it, and we look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Have a great yep. day, everyone. Be safe. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.